Dr. Michael Nadorf, welcome to Shrink Wrap Radio. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Well, I'm really excited to have you here. Uh, dreams, we're going to be discussing your research in dreams. And uh, also, towards the end of the interview, we'll talk a bit about the upcoming International Association for the Study of Dreams conference, where you'll be one of the uh, keynote speakers. So that's kind of the overall map. And awesome. dreams, yeah, dreams are a topic of longstanding interest for me, uh, mainly from a clinical and personal exploration point of view. And um, so I'm curious about, now you're, you're primarily a researcher, is that right? Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah. And so how did you come to be interested in dreams? You know, it's, it's really an interesting story and in a way embarrassing, but I'm, I'm proud to tell it because I think it shows the importance of this area. So I went to grad school very much focused on being a suicide researcher. That was my path. That's what I wanted to do. And um, so I got involved with behavioral sleep medicine and I was really interested on in the impact of insomnia on suicidal behavior. But there's a little bit of a literature at that point showing that nightmares were also associated. But for most of that literature, it hadn't controlled for anxiety or for uh, PTSD or a lot of the other things that are associated with nightmares. So I thought, you know, I, I think as soon as I control for these factors, it's not going to matter. Uh -huh. So I did the research. I controlled for those. Lo and behold, nightmares were still significantly associated with suicide. And the further I went, study after study, they kept emerging as being really meaningful predictors of suicidality. And eventually I just realized it's like, I have to follow this. And yeah. it, it's, it's interesting because I'm now probably more known for that line of research than my suicide research. Um, but it's just because they kept being important. So I kept following them. Yeah. And the more I went into it, the more I realized how cool of an area it is. Well, I have to back you up a bit and uh, ask you, how did you get so interested in suicide? Uh, yeah. I sh should throw in, I right after I got my PhD, I think I, think I can recall helping <laughs> to set up uh, to train volunteers for a suicide mm -hmm. line, phone for line. Sure. And uh, so how did you get, you know, about your dreams, you know, I might say, well, what dreams you remember from childhood, but I assume yeah. you didn't commit suicide. Uh, no. How did you get so interested in yeah. suicide? You know, that's an interesting story, too. All my, apparently all my path stories are interesting. Um, Good. <laughs> so my grandmother died by suicide. But what interests me about that, that actually happened um, on nine years before I was born. So like, it, it's weird for something that happened well before you were born to shape your career. But for me, it was that it was a family secret. We were actually told growing uh -huh. up that she died of cancer. And I found out in high school that it was actually a suicide. Wow. And it just blew my mind of just trying to reconcile, you know, why was that kept from us for so many years? And also just putting the pieces together with my family and understanding, you know, some of the weird relationships and why they are the way they are. And, you know, once it, it just got me thinking, like, well, a couple things. One was how meaningful is it that even though it happened nine years before I was born, it was still having those reverberations in my family. Yeah. And secondly, I had this realization as I got into psychology and I kept thinking, you know, this is one of the big questions in psychology. Surely we know a lot about this. And as I went on, I kept realizing there's a lot we don't know and we're not good at predicting it. And I thought, you know, if someone with a personal connection isn't willing to do this research, who's going to do it? So that's what first led me to wanting to study suicide. And, um, and it went and maybe psychology as well. What, what, made you want to study psychology? It was really that question. And um, I, and I had interest in psychology broadly anyway. Um, my aunt was a school psychologist. And so I, I always found a lot of these questions interesting. Whenever 
just throughout all my studies, I always went back to the psychological questions. Like I didn't, I enjoyed studying history, not because of history in and of itself, but I like to think about why did people make the choices they did and what mm-hmm. led to that and and just the the interpersonal relationships and factors in play. So I always had that mindset. And um, so that combined with this interest just brought me to. Well, it's interesting that you didn't become a clinical psychologist, uh, that you weren't drawn to becoming a therapist, because I think many people who have the kind of background that you've had would have gone in that direction. Uh, well, but it's good to that be you, clear, uh, I am trained. I am trained as a clinical psychologist. I just primarily do research, but okay. I do have that that side for sure. Uh huh. So there's that side as well, and of course, there's a growing recognition of the impact of things of of family history mm-hmm. and how it can uh, of trauma, uh, family mm-hmm. trauma, and and of course, there's so much shame around suicide oh yeah yeah and i think that's getting better slowly but surely but you know i think one of the things that's really held us back as a field was how little it was talked about because of that stigma one of the things i'll usually lead off with in talks is just you know i put up the number of suicides and that doesn't mean anything because big numbers you know people struggle with big numbers you need context but when you realize that there are more suicides every year than motor vehicle accidents, you know, that really gives context because people will quickly be able to think of, you know, those that they know that died in motor vehicle accidents and you hear about those a lot. It just shows you there are that many more suicides. You just don't hear about them. Do you ever ask for a show of hands on how many people have had a suicide in their families? Mm-hmm. And what, I've what done kind, that. And, what sort um, of numbers do you see there? Oh, it, it's almost everybody either has someone in their family or, or a close friend or, you know, just it's very, almost all of us are, are touched by it. And, it and you get more of an opening now because people are talking about it more and realizing that they are being impacted a lot more than they did previously. Yeah, uh, certainly my hand would go up if uh, mm-hmm. if I were in the audience <laughs> for that question. And uh, a lot of stuff comes up in terms of, uh, of a relative and then of people in, in graduate school and, mm-hmm. and so on. And uh, we don't forget those people, do we? Like a, no. another couple <laughs> just popped into my mind as we're talking oh, yeah. about this. Well, and then you did also two famous individuals and you know, one that's burned in my head for many different reasons. It actually happened the day before my daughter was born. Uh, Robin Williams. You know, Robin Williams, death, oh, yeah. you know, I think, affected a lot of people. Um, oh, yeah. I was in love with him as a comedian. Oh, I mean, I just what a funny, <laughs> manic, funny guy. Yeah. <laughs> so there are so many, you know, that just so, there's so much we lose, you know, and, and one of the tragedies, there are so many tragedies with Susan, but one of the biggest is that you lose your best and your brightest you know that's one of the the things that surprises people but you're not talking about those that are really well they're struggling for sure but these are not people that from the outside one would look at them and say they are not successful usually they're your most successful students they're you know at the top of their class it's they they're used to getting a four zero, and now they're getting a three eight um but you lose so many brilliant people. Yeah, yeah. That's that's something to ponder. <laughs> it, you know, like, would you, uh, I remember a question in college, and I don't know where it came from. Would you rather be a wise Socrates or a dumb pig? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know if yeah. I got that right or not, but it's I think buried in that somewhere is the sense that uh, consciousness and brilliance mm-hmm. can bring. Uh, well, we know that there's a, a, t- a tendency for our consciousness to go to the negative yeah. anyway. And for somebody who's particularly bright, they might be particularly good <laughs> at mm-hmm. seeing the, the awfulness, uh, the potential awfulness of existence. 
for sure. And yeah, you know, and it's tricky. We know um, 2019 data just came out. It was the first time in over a decade that the suicide rate did not go up. Um, which I'm thankful for. But, you know, in general, if you look over the last decade, suicide rates got up about 25%. So just this huge increase. And there are a lot of reasons for it, but I, I think part of it, I don't want to blame social media. There's plenty of good that comes with social media, but it also enables us to compare ourselves with others. And one of the hard things that I think comes with that is people, you're not getting a full view. I, I remember a match the conversation I had with my wife uh, shortly after my daughter was born, where she said, you know, other parents don't have these same problems. And I said, sure they do. It's just people don't usually post about the tantrum at Target. They usually post about, you know, here are the cute pictures you know, of, of my kid. But you get kind of a one-sided view sometimes right. yeah. from social media. And it's easier to think that, you know, you're doing significantly worse than everyone else's. Well, I particularly worry, I agree with you about that. And I particularly worry about the impact on young people, mm -hmm. on uh, adolescents <clears throat> and below. And <clears throat> I'm sure there must be some kind of correlation with, with uh, <laughs> social media and, the, and a rise in, I'm guessing that there's been a rise in adolescent suicides as a result. There has been. And... And it's been across the board. It's been um, boys, girls, every death, different ethnic group. Um, but yeah, it's actually been more pronounced there. Um, I should remember the exact number, but I believe it's over a 40% rise in the last decade for, for wow. youth and adolescents. Yeah. Do you have any advice since we're talking about this yeah. and of course your child is young i assume yes yeah, six six okay do you have any advice for parents to how they might uh suicide proof their adolescence it's a big question i know oh it's hard and you know the biggest thing I think is just always having the communication lines open, which I know is easier said than done, especially as your kids get older into the teenage years, but having it where as much as possible, you're getting an accurate assessment of how they're doing. And, um, and that when they struggle, you're someone that they'll come and go to, to talk. And, you know, one of the things actually that gives me confidence as a parent um, we have a couple of youth suicide prevention grants, um, one specifically for our campus, and then the other one we're part of the team for Mississippi. And so as part of that, I've collected a lot of data. Um, and one of the things I've asked is, it, if you need help, who do you go to? And even for our college students, the vast majority, the first person is still my parents. And that's great. Yeah, so you yeah. wanna still have it be where you are safe, you know, a safe home base, for them to go to um, and maintain that. And you know, the other thing I'd say, and this is both for parents, but also uh, for anyone that's lost someone by suicide, predicting suicide's impossible. And I say that because there's actually a study that came out um, 2017, so pretty recently, it's this large meta-analysis. And a couple of things really stuck out in that paper. Uh, one is in the last 50 years, we have not improved at all in our ability to predict suicide. Despite all the literature advances, despite all the research, we haven't improved. And if you look at trained clinicians, the, their ability to predict suicide, imminent suicide risk, it's no better than flipping a coin. So that's kind of amazing actually, given oh, the. Yeah the uh, statistical tools that we have now and uh, oh, yeah. and what they call big data. Yeah, so all the models, all the machine learning, we're still far from it. So I think often, you know, especially if you've lost someone, it's easy to say, how did I not know? How did I not put the pieces together? And I think it's so important to realize that even for someone using the latest measures, someone that's a clinician that's been trained to do this, we still miss half the time. So what I take from what you're saying is that uh, 
we should stop torturing ourselves. If only I had seen, if only I had known, if only I had said something exactly. that uh, people who've lost somebody, which will be almost all of us at some point, um, should take to heart you know, what you're saying, that even the, quotes experts aren't able to, mm -hmm. to predict it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And of course, it's, um, it's too early to say, but I'm wondering what the effect of the pandemic is going to be. Mm -hmm. and there's, probably, there's probably no data on that yet, I would assume, or am I yeah. wrong? It's early, and, you know, it's one of those where, a lot of us, myself included, have been collecting data throughout, and and right now it, it's still it's still messy because some of it just depends on what stage of the pandemic and what's going on in the world. Yeah, you know, how much people are isolated. Yeah, you know, I think that's a huge part of it. And you know, we're social creatures. We're made to be social to interact. Yeah. Right. And um, one of the greatest. Eh, I, I want to be careful with how I describe this, but. One of the things, if, if I had control over things and could have done things differently, I wish we hadn't have called it social distancing because that's not really what we meant. You know, we meant, we mean physical distancing, but, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. like going through this, we need the social connections more than ever. You know, yes. it's so easy to feel alone and isolated. And, um, you know, it's one of those where even just with little interactions, I tried to make sure, and I still am, that I, I'm doing uh, things to stay connected with my neighbors and my friends. And, uh -huh. um, you know, there's uh, an elderly lady that I used to see at church that I don't now. Um, my wife and I sent flowers over there one day just, you know, to, to say, hey, nice. you know, we're still, you're not forgotten. We're still thinking yeah. of you, even though we don't see you every week. And yeah. I, I think little things like that can make a big difference. And um, actually, I'll tie it back to suicide very briefly. Um, one of the cool studies that's been done that I always like to talk about was there's a study that was done where um, it was from a um, psychiatric hospital and they had two groups. One group was just the, after discharge, nothing happened. The other group, um, after this charge, a year later, they got a letter, just a tearing letter saying, hey, we're still thinking of you. If there's anything that you ever need, let us know. Believe it or not, the group that got that letter had significantly lower suicide rates after that. Now, how long after the release was the, uh, so was, was the note sent? It was a year later. A year later, okay. Yeah, so on the anniversary of their discharge. Wow. Yeah, that that's a very uh, interesting and telling study. Yeah, just little things. And and that's why I carry and that's why I tell people because it's easy to think, especially someone like this pandemic, that what can I do? Well, you know, that little check-in that you do, even if it's just seeing someone, you know, when you're putting out your trash at the same time and just yell over across the street, how are you doing? Are the kids okay? Things like that really make a huge difference. Yeah, that's interesting because I've been having conversations with uh, one of the neighbor ladies next door to us, and I was jokingly talking, saying, uh, you know, people used to talk about talking over the fence, and yeah. we're talking over the trash bins. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. As we go out at the same time, at the same time, we're both going to our trash bin, and then we'll get into a conversation, and I discover that uh, that this neighbor actually, you know, who I've had various projections yeah. and judgments about, you know, yeah. that are baseless, right? Uh, and she's incredibly bright and articulate yeah. and knows all kinds of things about the local flora and fauna, and I'm learning yeah. all of this stuff from her. It, you know, I don't know. It's funny where your mind takes you, and actually that's the said way to dreams too, that'll be kind of interesting, but it reminded me one of the things my daughter wanted to do this year that we did was we watched Home Alone. And I don't know how many will remember the movie, but you know, there's the neighbor that Kevin was always so afraid of 
And then there's that neighbor that at the end saved the day and end up being, uh-huh. the, you know, being the good guy. But, but often, you know, it's easy to have those projections in the absence of information or with little information. And it is amazing how much they change once you actually do get to have a conversation with someone. Yeah. Let's, let's come back to dreams. I'm wondering, do you have, uh, were dreams at all important to you in any way in your life growing up uh, prior to becoming a psychologist and researcher? Yeah, that's part of where my path is so interesting because they really weren't. And, um, and also with where I did my training, I, I trained at West Virginia, which is this behavioral stronghold, like the last place you would go to study dreams. Uh. Um, and so in a way, I, I'm kind of proud of both those facts because it shows how remarkable the effect was with getting into this research and learning about it because I, I had no tie. And if anything, I had things working against me with my training being behavioral. But still, as I got into it, as I learned more, um, especially it was really the research that drove me, just realizing how impactful it is. And um, I guess to go back to suicide very briefly, um, I'll tell you the study that just blew my mind. Um, it was um, just Drum and colleagues. And this was um, about 2009 is when it was published. Um, they had 160 individuals who had a previous suicide attempt. They followed them for two years after their release from the hospital. Just looking at what factors predicted uh, future suicide attempts. And what they found is um, having nightmares even after you controlled for depression, anxiety, PTSD, and substance use, so after you controlled for your main predictors, having nightmares put you at fourfold increased risk. So 400% increase just by having nightmares. And yeah, I thought, geez, like, you know, it, it tells you how meaningful these dreams are. And, um, and then when I started working clinically with those who, who have nightmares, um, just one of the uh, main symptoms that you'll see, and it's mentioned in the ICSD, is um, avoidance of sleep. And, you know, for most of us, you know, I've always been a healthy sleeper. I've been fortunate with that. Um, you know, I love to go to sleep. That's a good time for me. <laughs> me <too. laughs> um, yeah, I can't wait to do it. And to think that those who have nightmares are so miserable. They want to avoid them so badly and they feel so helpless doing so that they will actively avoid sleep. I mean, that tells you how miserable it is. Yeah. And that also could compound whatever the underlying problem is, right? Oh yeah, it does. It absolutely does. And, and so there's that side and that's the side of the research that I really know. And part of the reason I'm so excited about this conference is there's a lot I don't know on the good side of dreams and of nightmare or not of nightmares uh-huh. of dreams. And so I am just nerding out on all of this because it's both, I get to play the expert when it comes to nightmares, but also I am learning so much through all my um, communications and through, you know, I'm just really looking forward to the presentations because there's a lot I don't know. And it's a, yeah. it's honestly a gap in my training that I'm really looking forward to failing. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I've i been a, uh, I've gone to a lot of the IASD conferences and as you say, learn a lot. I think I was, um, I got to meet some of the people who started it mm-hmm. uh, years ago, <laughs> a long time ago, and uh, and learned a lot from them. Um, now, are you a member to have you joined? I need to do that. I've actually been talking to them that I'm going to, I have not yet, but I am going to. <laughs> I encourage you to, it's an, it's such an incredible organization because it's a mix of academics, of professors and researchers and, uh, major authors in the field and ordinary people. 
Yeah. And how many professional organizations combine those two audiences? The only yeah. other one that I'm aware of where that's happening that I'm aware of is uh, psychedelic research, mm -hmm. which uh, is a new thing that's coming around again. Yeah. And, uh, and I've been to a conference and heard about others, other organizations within that whole uh, Renaissance area of interest that put the researchers and the professors and the experts on a similar footing with those who are just super interested. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's so valuable. Yeah, so so, so th that is great. And um, maybe we'll talk a bit more about the conferences. I want to make sure we've milked all this other stuff for all it's worth. For sure. Um, so what's your sense of, um, of why people have nightmares? Ah, uh, yes. There, there are so many layers to this, and it depends how nerdy you want to get. Um, I actually, one of the things I need to write up, because, of course, I was trained as a behaviorist, and, and anything dreams is like the area that behaviorists forgot. Um, I actually have a behavioral theory of nightmares, um, which goes into essentially what happens with a nightmare is we know that you have an awakening during the dream. And that's part of the reason why you have that memory. And when you really think about what's happening with that, it's an avoidance behavior. So it, you know, if you wake up from that dream, that's negatively reinforcing. It's taking something aversive away. And what that means is that anytime then you have something threatening in your dreams, you're going to be very quickly to just, you know, pull the ripcord and get out of there. But in doing so, you're making it so then you wake up and you realize that you had this experience. Whereas if you had actually slept through it, you know, you'd have no recollection of it, most likely. So one of the things that I think, you know, has been really interesting and the way I think a lot of these treatments work for nightmares is by trying to change that content. So there's not anything you have to escape, you know, and when you look at the restricting, which, you know, I used a lot of imagery rehearsal therapy. Um, obviously you try to change the whole, you know, dream. So it's not, um, not frightening if you can, but sometimes you can't, you know, you have people where sometimes, especially if they've had a traumatic experience, but they may have it where it's a traumatic dream, but it's not a repeat of their, their trauma, it's always something different, but you're often in a victimized role. And when that happens, usually that's where uh, we'll work on um, doing imagery with having superpowers in dreams, because the great thing about a dream is it's a dream. You can, you know, anything you can yeah. do in a dream, you can build in. So right. I'm like, you can have a force field, you can fly, you can, anything. You know, what superpower do you want to have so that when these things happen, if you have these happen in your dream, you don't need to escape them. You, you have a different way to escape. You have a better way to get out of there and not have it where you just have that startled awakening where you become essentially a slave to your dreams. Yeah, you know, we want to have it where you have control over this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's interesting that that has become mainstream because uh, I gather it has become mainstream mm -hmm. and has, has been gathered under the the uh, behavioral approach. Uh, and it, because there were people talking about that way back, you know, in the uh, <clears throat> in the seventies, I guess, yeah. uh, and. Uh, and the whole concept of lucid dreaming, which mm -hmm. uh, was known in uh, Tibet <laughs> and yeah. other places like that, and you know, in so-called primitive groups, and, uh, and we were kind of late to tumble on, tumble to it. And people, you know, there were people who took it seriously enough to mm -hmm. engage in self-training and and trying to train other people to become lucid dreamers. And um, have you been able to, to become lucid yourself? I haven't. I've done the treatment with others and had some success with that. Um, 
but I haven't personally. And, and some of it though is because I sleep like a rock. It's lots of more in my CPAP. I do have apnea. So it's lots of more in the CPAP. Um, uh. So I'm one where I actually don't remember a lot of my dreams, which is again, why it's so odd that I'm in this area, but, yeah. um, but also it's interesting working with those that really do have those, you know, vivid dreams. And it's, I, I don't usually, but, and I have, you know, it's funny. I tend to feel like I have weird dreams. Maybe it's because I'm an administrator, but there's always some problem I'm solving. It's never actually one I have. I wish I could say it was, you know, productive, but there's always something that I'm working on solving. Um, in my dreams when I do remember them, but yeah, it's, yeah. it's not super common that I do. Yeah. I had an idea that flitted through. I'm trying to remember what it was. Um, I, I have uh, I've sort of half-heartedly, well, not, not with total devotion, tried to develop uh, lucid dreaming in myself. And um, a couple of instances stand out where the moment that I realized I was lucid, I was so excited that it woke me up. <laughs> so it's like, yeah. oh, I'm aware yeah. that I'm dreaming, you know, because I know this is a goal and sure. isn't this wonderful? And it sure. pulls me right out of the dream. So, <laughs> so it's, it's finding that midst of, yeah, gaining lucidity, but... Not too much lucidity. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Um, so have we spoken, you know, related research that I've heard, and I want to check with you to see if this matches up with what you yeah. know, that people who've, who have nightmares as a result of traumas the dream does the content of the dream does not tend to be a reenactment of the actual trauma. Have you heard that? Is there research to bear that out? Now, the, on TV and all, yeah. we've gotten the idea that the person they're back in Vietnam or they're back in Iraq, yeah. and yeah, I think they're vividly replaying the same thing. Now that may happen. Yeah, I think it's very variable. Um, I haven't seen anything that's actually looked at the the proportions that'd be interesting but you know just thinking back to those i've treated over the years um certainly i've had some that have been in it that repeat of it but i would probably say most have not um and you know i, I think one of the differences too and and this is just you know not based on research this is just my own anecdotal um some depends on the trauma where yeah, I, the ones that seem to be a repeat are more of if there was a single event that happened. And the themes that are more like a chronic recurring thing um, have been less so. Those have been more where, you know, there's always something different, but I'm always a victim or, I'm you know, there's always something yeah. that happens that I can't control. And... Um, I don't know. I'd love to see more research on that because I think it, knowing the difference would be interesting. But, um, but yeah, I mean, trauma affects us in so many ways. And you know, one of the things that a lot of people don't realize, it's in older literature, people, you know, it, it, people don't look as much, of course, at dreams or nightmares as I think they should. But, you know, with, with nightmares, people will always think of it as a symptom of PTSD. And surely it is. What people don't realize is that actually having nightmares before a trauma makes it more likely for you to develop PTSD. It's actually a risk factor. Huh. That's interesting. So, you know, then the question is, why is that? And, you know, the, the best guess I have, uh, and this is research that is fairly new because I've been trying for years to explain like why nightmares are associated with suicide and, and spinning my wheels, you know, just everything I found, just nothing mediated. Um, the thing that's starting to hold some water and I think might explain, you know, both parts, both the PTSD and the suicide 
is with nightmares, you do have an association with um, problems with emotion regulation. And it might be that um, that is underlying both of them. Yeah. Uh, still early days with, with the research, but that's at least what some early results are showing. Yeah, that's, that's not surprising to hear because what I was thinking as you were describing that is some kind of a vulnerability to fear. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, yeah, that'd be a very, very interesting thing to, to follow up on and know more about. Mm. Wow. I'm wondering where are the, are there controversies in the area you know, where you study the, the stuff that you know about, are there like hot controversies that you're hoping to resolve or that we should know about? <laughs> yeah, I'd say less controversies. There are the little, the little debates that only real nightmare dream nerds debate over, but actually I think you'll get a kick out of this and you may already know about it. Uh, have you heard about the debate between bad dreams and nightmares? No. Okay. So um, technically there is a difference between bad dreams and nightmares. So a bad dream is just what you describe, just a normal dream that you have that does not lead to a startled awakening, but where you classify it as disturbing. Um, and a nightmare is a bad dream that has a, a startled awakening. And so there's been this debate uh. um over whether or not these are actually different or are they just maybe even different levels of the same phenomenon. And there's been very little data on it. So it, everyone argues very strongly with very little evidence. And I had kind of leaned on the side of um, them being the same phenomenon, just different strengths. But we've been working on creating a, a measure of nightmares for several years. And We've just been doing a lot of factor analytic work. And what's interesting is they do seem to be pulling apart where, you know, at least statistically, they don't seem to be measuring the same factors, bad dreams and nightmares when asked separately. And we, we did define, you know, whether or not it leads to that startled awakening. They seem to be separate and they seem to be associated with psychopathology um, and other factors differently, which... Again, not, I was not guessing. So I thought that was kind of interesting. And Yeah, that is fascinating. Trying to understand about, the difference. Yeah, what about anxiety dreams? I have mm -hmm. suffered uh, during much of my life from uh, teaching anxiety dreams. Yeah. <laughs> having been a professor, having been a student forever and then a professor. And I think the teaching anxiety dream and the the test anxiety dream of the student are probably yeah. closely related. Oh, absolutely. It, it's right up there. With, yeah. Showing up for getting to have studied for the test or for getting your locker combo. Um, and actually I'll, I'll tie it in, in with another one that I, I swear it's like, of course, a PhD had this. Um, there's someone I treated a while back, um, a while back, geez, about a decade ago, um, PhD in English. And, she always had the same theme. There's always a different nightmare, but it was always on the theme of there's something I was responsible for. I forgot and something bad happened. And I think too, when you're in our field, you know, you, you have a lot of those anxieties because you're spinning so many, you know, so many um, plates at the same time. And obviously, you know, we, we do know that reducing the anxiety can help. Um, I actually have a paper um, from back when I was working on a anxiety team where we showed that there is a decrease in bad dreams in those after um, GAD treatment. But also, at least with that... DAD? DAD? Oh, oh, sorry, generalized anxiety disorder. So having a lot of worry. Okay. okay. Yeah, sorry, darn acronyms. I appreciate the clarification. Um and with, you know, with that PhD though, you know, we did the imagery rehearsal therapy, we did the restricting and actually just changed it to, um, I thought I had forgotten to do something. I checked and I had already done it. And we had her actually 
do visual imagery with a, a dream that we designed with that, you know, checking and having already done something. And she found some success with that. So one thing that could be considered, yeah, I wouldn't say there's strong evidence behind it, but, you know, for those that do have anxiety or worry dreams, it may be worth trying that if it is a specific worry that you have, um, just to see if it could help. Say that again to do what with it? So we changed hers so that instead of being, I was responsible for this, I forgot and something bad happened. To have it where I was still responsible for it, but I checked and I had already done it. It was already done. You know? Yeah. And I just remembered, oh yeah, I did that a couple of days ago. So, so maybe something that can easily be changed depending on what the worry is. So, you know, you, you can, decreasing the worry is probably the best way to go about it. But if you can't, um, another way might be just to try to do visualizations of the opposite of whatever that worry is, which yeah. it kind of makes sense when you think about it. Yeah. You know, I, uh, <clears throat> I used to uh, teach a class on dreams and uh, I don't know if it was in the dreams class or the counseling class, but I shared with students that I had these teaching anxiety dreams. Yeah. And, um, and I asked them to, uh, to try something to help me with that. And so I shared with them that often the content of the dream was um, I was unprepared. I didn't, I didn't know what I was going to talk about. So I find myself in that situation. And, uh, and I can't get the students' attention they're talking to each other and they're maybe throwing spit wads and, you know, mm -hmm. just things like that. So, mm -hmm. so um, we did a, a thing where they were going to decondition me by, yeah. by acting this out. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I think it had an impact. I mean, it, it was it was difficult standing up there in the front, and they all started talking and ignoring me and throwing spit wads and getting yeah. up and you know uh, leaving the room without asking for permission. Yeah, <laughs> all kinds of everything that would happen in a nightmare. And I think it had a I think it did have an impact. I can't I like say it. If, yeah, yeah, it was kind of fun. It remind, this is somewhat off topic. Forgive me for that, but I think you'll appreciate this, especially having been a, a teacher. Um, again, I trained at West Virginia, super behavioral place, and we were a bunch of nerds. So I don't know. One of my colleagues thought of this. I have no idea who it was. But um, with one of our very behavioral teachers, we had worked out, okay, if he's on this side of the classroom, we're going to really be attentive. We're going to ask a lot yeah. of questions. If he's over here we're not. And over time, we really shaped him into a corner. And at the end of the year, we asked, do you ever realize why you teach in that corner? And it was one of those where he was both proud and kind of angry at us at the same time, but more proud. Yeah, yeah just wow. But yeah. But yeah, students have an impact on you for sure. And, yeah, and those interactions classic. are meaningful. Right, right. It underscores what you said at the at the top of our interview that we're social creatures yeah, and uh, that that feedback that we get from other people is so important. Exactly. <laughs> and it, and it, it sh and it, and it shapes us in ways that we're not consciously aware of, yep. which, um, you know, circles back to the whole pandemic thing <laughs> again, I oh, think. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, now, I, I also uh, wrote a, uh, co-authored a book about a, a serial killer, a famous serial killer case, the Zodiac. Yeah. And I did kind of a psychological analysis. And so people would, uh, and going into that, I was a little worried. Am I going to have nightmares about this? Is this going to get in and mess with my sure. head? Or sure. can I handle this? And so I'm happy to report that my defenses are, are such that I didn't. Yeah. Except, except there was one time, and I think it was during the period that I was writing the book or shortly mm -hmm. thereafter, that I had a, um, 
there was a sort of intrusion of a, maybe of an attacker or mm -hmm. somebody behind me. And it was, uh, it was, uh, it was like, <gasps> and yeah. I woke up just like that. It was like, <gasps> yeah. whoa. And that was so powerful, you know, that I remember it even to, to tell it yeah, now. Unfortunately, sure. that's the only time that that ever happened to me in a dream. But uh, I think it's, probably a good example of what you're talking about yeah. of nightmares that then interfere with sleep. If people get that kind of experience regularly. Well, and actually let me play off this. I, I really would love to get your take on this and also go back to um, kind of the question of, of why people have nightmares. Um, so one of the things that many of us believe in um in the nightmare area, all like 20 of us that do this work, is um, that nightmares also, I think, have some healing properties after a trauma. It's not pleasant, but it's kind of the body zone exposure therapy. Yeah, yeah. And, and so kind of a rule of thumb as far as treating is if it's within a month, let it be because that might be, you know, it's the body doing exposure therapy um, and, and working its way through. And one of the thoughts that I've had is, again, going back to that escape behavior, um, you know, what, what we know about exposure therapy is you got to get all the way through. And if you stop in the middle, if you do that avoidance and you stop in the middle when your anxiety's up, it just strengthens that association between the anxiety and that fear. Uh -huh. And so I think some of it is that, you know, for why do people, why do some people get stuck? You know, why do they keep having them? I think they, for whatever reason, they didn't get through. They didn't get through. They started this avoidance. The avoidance got reinforced. And now that's their go-to. Their body keeps trying to push through it. And yeah. they keep waking up because behaviorally they've been conditioned to do so. Um, whereas, you know, it doesn't surprise me at all. I, I think most people probably would have the same response you would. Maybe they have one, maybe they have two. Uh but they get through those dreams, you know, fairly quickly, and then it's done. I, th I think that part of the therapy then would be to reframe the nightmares, as, you, as I think you were suggesting, that as part of a homeostatic self-healing mm -hmm. process, yeah. that uh, the, the body-mind uh, engages in, and if they can begin during their waking conscious state to accept that kind of a framework, yep. then it would be a lot less charged. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see here. Well, what are you going to be presenting at IASD? Do you, do you have your PowerPoint together yet? <laughs> For the most part, a mix of all of this, it's a mix of, um, the research that's been done on suicide, talking some about uh, what's been done in nightmare treatment, uh, which it's a really impressive literature. Um, nightmares are surprisingly responsive to therapy. Um, and what that it actually presents a really neat opportunity. I think they're one of the most untapped opportunities in psychology. Um, one of my favorite studies um, shows that when you treat nightmares, well, a couple of things. A, the treatment is pretty easy. It's super brief, one to three sessions, and um, and it's enjoyable to do. So keeping that all in mind, when you do it, um, not only does it have a large improvement on nightmares, you actually see the same with post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and one of the things that's never made sense to me, and again, yeah, I'm a behaviorist. I appreciate an exposure therapy as much as the next person. Why do we start with that? You know, exposure is so tough for many people. And, and I've seen so many people, you know, go into a prolonged exposure and they, they'll never go back to a psychologist again. You know, they're like, uh -huh. you know what? I, I can't do this. I'm, therapy's not for me. Yeah. And it made me realize that, you know, like that's an effective treatment, but that's our surgery. Why are we starting with surgery? 
Yeah, if we have a treatment like this, for someone that maybe has had a trauma, has PTSD, but has nightmares, why don't we start there? We have evidence showing that it has a significant impact on PTSD symptoms. And let's see where we're at. You know, maybe some people won't need surgery, but you know, that I think it's a missed opportunity and it's research that needs to be done. And I'm starting to work on it. There's been other groups too. Uh, there's a, you know, just one of those unfortunate things. There's a really nice study that was started by Daniel Taylor. Um, and last I heard, it was funded by Department of Defense. But I think they went in or they ran into recruitment issues and they weren't able to finish it. So it's one of those where it's like, darn, I really wanted the results of that because I think they'd be good. Um, but I, I think nightmare, well, I know nightmare treatment is underutilized. But I think it's underutilized for more than just the nightmares. I think it really could have a broad effect. So some of what I'll present too is starting to give at least my own take on places this, where this can go and really hopefully soliciting feedback from others of what are other opportunities that I'm not thinking of? Because while I know the nightmares, there's a lot with the dreams that I'm brand new to. So what are opportunities for these types of treatments um, that aren't being used or not, you know, being fully leveraged because it's amazing how impactful they are. You know, before, before I let you go, um, uh, take us through that treatment that you say yeah. is the standard treatment that you do. It lasts three days. Mm -hmm. Take us through those three days, if you would. So it's really it's so basic. I always actually start with people showing them the literature on it because otherwise you won't believe it works because it's so, it, it seems so simple to people, but really what you do is um, you have someone take the dream that they want to change the nightmare. And I, I tell people, I don't believe this is an exposure based therapy. That's another nerdy debate people will have, but you know, tell me about the nightmare you want to change just enough so I know what we're dealing with. Uh, not that we're trying to expose you to it. But you take that, you write in great detail a new dream that you want to replace it. You can change anything about it. And you can change as much about it as you want. The main thing is have it be a dream that you would really like to have. And then you practice that about two times a day five to 10 minutes each time using visual imagery. And often one of two things will happen. Either you'll just stop having the nightmare or you'll start having the new dream. And that can be really cool. Um, oh, yeah. One of my favorite stories that helps illustrate it was um, a veteran I saw, you know, many moons ago where his job was he drove the bus to go pick up the soldiers and bring them back. And he had this recurrent nightmare that he had a bus full of soldiers and was driving back to base and it was just starting to get dark. And he just had this dread come over him that he knows that that's when really bad things happen. And he woke up at that point. So I said, okay, you know, how do you want to change it? And he said, here, here's what I would love, you know, Instead of driving the bus, I want to be driving my minivan. I want my kids in the back. And um, I want to go to the park. And, you know, one of my greatest regrets is that my dad died before my kids were born. I want my dad to be there. And I want him to be able to see my kids playing and my kids to be able to meet my dad. So I said, okay, let's try it. And so the next session, he's just breaking down in my waiting room. And I'm still a trainee when this happens. So I'm like, oh my gosh, what did I do wrong? I've broken the guy, you know? So I pull him back and he said, I started having that new dream. And it was just so meaningful to me to have that experience. And I thought, how cool is that? Yeah, How really? cool is that? And just such an, a simple intervention of, you know, basically giving some, someone something to visualize is really what it is. And in doing that, having them not only treat the nightmare, but to have this meaningful experience that he really wanted to have. 
that was really cool. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. That's great. So I think that um, uh, at the conference, you, there's going to be a very rich opportunity for you to get feedback from yeah. people in the audience. And some of them are, you know, be, of course, I'm picturing it live. This is a virtual conference. Do you have it the is. dates in front of you? I should have had that. but It looks like it's June 13th through the 17th. Okay. So uh, it's coming up soon. Yeah. And so this is partly promo that I want to let people who are uh, watching us right now are listening to us to know that they uh, that they should look into this. They should go to uh, uh, asd.org. No, asdreams.org. Yeah. And uh, so it's a virtual conference and it's open to anybody. And it's spread out over days. And I'm, I'm sure they're probably different. You'll be able to choose which tr tracks you want to go into because that's how the in person conferences were always yeah. organized. And uh, <clears throat> so I hope you get the. <laughs> the kind of uh, intense feedback that we used to get in person uh, because it'd be smart people there and from all oh, yeah. sorts of different perspectives. And uh, so I, I'm sure it's going to be for you a learning experience as well as a presenting experience. I'm and so wanted... excited for it. I'm yeah, really pumped. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Well, Michael, it's been nice meeting you and hanging out with Likewise. you here. And I, I really want to thank you for being my guest today on Shrink Wrap Radio. Thank you for having me. This was a lot of fun.